Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Casey Turner Presents Talk To Me. Today's show is super special. We've got the wonderful Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin all the way up in Portland, Oregon. Hey guys, how y'all doing? Hello, good to see you. It's so good to see you too. Thank you all so much for tuning in and joining this conversation. Please share this, help us get as many people watching as possible, start a watch party, I, I really don't know what that means, but I, I heard it helps. And also, please comment below and let us know where you're watching from. It's always cool to go back and see um, how far away people are watching from. So let us know. And if you've seen either Anna or Jeffrey live in concert, let us know where you first saw them. Share some of your experiences below. Make new friends. And if this is your first time being introduced to them and their music, you're in for a big treat. They're two of my favorite songwriters. And... Uh, you're, you're going to discover two of your favorite ones today, too, if this is the case. But needless to say, thanks for joining in and thanks for being here. Also below in the comments, you'll see links to both of their websites where you can purchase uh, their records and merchandise oh, and support them. So please do that. And if you want, you can throw a couple bucks in the uh, podcast tip jar because as all of us are sitting here in our homes, uh, we ain't playing no shows and we ain't making no doughs. Hardly, except for your support out there. So thank you all. But without further ado, welcome, Anna Tibble and Jeffrey Martin. Good to Thanks, see you guys. Good to see you too. <laughs> Sorry for that. Was a long, that was a long intro. That one almost got me out of breath. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, one of the things I try my best to do on these is I put a note, at all my notes, it says talk less. So I'm going to do my best. <laughs> yeah. No, you uh, talk as much as you want. Yeah, you you don't let them tell you to talk less. <laughs> but how are you guys doing? Are you guys holding up okay? I think. I'm getting better. I think it was a rough kind of three or four weeks to, I don't know, find this new like equilibrium, I guess, or this new pace. And now, now I have some good days. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we both are feeling pretty lucky to, to have made it home from a cut short European tour right as this all got started, as things like the airports were closing down and I think we've that went pretty good and I don't know we feel glad to have a place to be and yeah. but yeah strange wild darkness this is yeah. yeah where were you at when you know March 12th or whatever we are all are calling yeah. the COVID we doomsday in, happened we were in Spain first Anna was playing a festival there in Spain that was kind of like the beginning of this month month and a little bit tour that we were doing in Europe and then I guess we were in we uh, tried to go to France. Oh, yeah, we were in France. Yeah. We were on our way to Switzerland to, like, start the tour officially. And then we had to we had to cancel the tour in France before. So I never even got to play a gig. <laughs> I just I just had a very expensive year. We just drank like, a lot of wine and vacation. then came home. <laughs> <laughs> Which was fun until, <laughs> until I looked at my bank account at home. But, yeah. Oh, I mean, I've, so, <laughs> yeah, I, th I can't remember what episode I'm on, 13 or 14, and, and everyone's got their own you know, kind of horror story experience as a touring musician, whether, whether they were on the road or just about to start a tour or had to unravel their summer. But I think you guys are the first I've talked to that were actually in the thick of it. I mean, and so far away from home, yeah. getting home during something like this must have been super stressful, I assume. I don't know. Was, was it hard to get a fly? Did you, I mean, you had to just change everything around? Yeah, it was, yeah. I think we lucked out big time. So we had the way we had routed the tour originally. We were going to fly home um, early April from from Ireland, um, and so we were able to just move up that that ticket out of Dublin early. So we just had to get to Dublin from France, and um, so we didn't have to like buy a fresh ticket, which was lucky because yeah. they were so expensive all of a sudden. And and then yeah. you know the airports were a mess and stuff coming home, but but it was all okay. Kind of surprisingly, we got home. I mean, it took us many hours, but it was it was fine. And people were yeah. people were amazingly like gentle in the airport, considering all the like unknowns out there at the time and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Man, did you at least get to have a uh, Guinness in Dublin? Or no, I didn't even know. <laughs> everything was like closed. Like by the time we we did it, we where did we go? We had some hamburgers. Yeah, we, there was like we stayed <laughs> at an chicks. Airbnb for a night in near the airport, <laughs> and there was like this. American themed like, like 50s, 50s diner, diner. <laughs> with like malted milkshakes and cheeseburgers so that was that was oh. good it was a twilight zone for sure yeah I think we 
super lucked out to there like as we were looking to change our flight other flights were like going up as you looked at the computer into the like thousands upon thousands of dollars we're like oh my god yeah so i think yeah we really we, we were really definitely got thinking lucky. maybe we were just like we have some friends in ireland that were going to put us up and we were just thinking well we might just be here for a few months until we can get back but yeah well i'm terribly sorry that your tour got cut short but i'm glad you made it home safe and uh Oh, what a, yeah, what a just, uh, what a nightmare for a touring musician. Now, being home, uh, another kind of mixed review I've gotten from everyone is some people have felt have felt prolific and creative and wanting to write during this time, and some people are like, I don't even want to touch my guitar. Um, what what has this time been like for you guys when it comes to being creative and and writing and? Um, I uh, all of it. I think I I think in. I don't know, in my very deepest heart of a world, I was kind of really, really needing a break from a big, like a few years of just being gone way more than being home. And so I think for the first few weeks, I just was like pretty grateful inside of myself, even even as the news tumbled down. But uh, yeah, I, f I felt like really creative in stints and be like, oh man, I'm gonna make a whole record right now, and then, and then like, oh, I don't think I'll ever write a song again. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think all of it. What about I, you? Yeah, the same. It's, I, I, last night actually, I was I was looking through um, all the recordings I've made, like just voice memo shitty things since we've been home, and I realized that I've I've been writing a lot, like starting a lot of songs. But it feels, but because I have so much time also, it feels maybe like I should be making more in a weird way. So it was a good, like in normal times, if I was, if I had like four song starts in a week or something, that would be amazing. But now, now that I just have like endless expanse of time <laughs> and time in my mind and time to get paranoid and like whatever, I, I feel like I should have like an album per week and that's just not realistic. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you both do uh, tour pretty extensively, especially like you were saying over the last few years. Sometimes you guys tour together, and yeah. sometimes you guys tour separately. Has this been the most you guys have actually spent together at home? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. In, yeah, in, in like, in like, in like a decade, forever, yeah. Like ever, maybe. It's really yeah. like last night or the other night we were taking a walk and we were talking about how how we should go do something. Like go, <laughs> We should like go like sleep in the truck at the beach or something and just like whatever. But then I was thinking, like, we should probably just walk around the neighborhood and, like, be home because we never, <laughs> we just don't do this. It's really strange. It's We're great, thinking but. it's, like, always one person is always about to leave. And so when we are home together, it's always like, okay, we only have this, like, four days home together and yeah. then we'll see each other in a month and a half. And so it's very, just to, like, live side by side, it's a very new, yeah. It's going good, though. Yeah. We just oh, survived good. great in a garage together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. For some for some relationships that could be a blessing or a curse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it's so gonna be very so illuminating good. for a lot of <laughs> a lot of different ways. Yeah. Well, I wanna back up and kind of paint the story of how we even got here, um, for you guys and uh, wh whoever wants to kinda go first, but I'd love to talk about where you each grew up and uh what that kind of upbringing was like and then how music eventually entered your worlds as kids or as adults i don't know where it, where it happened for you all but uh um whoever wants to go first just kind of talking more about where where are you from um i i grew up mostly in in eugene oregon um a little bit in texas i was born in texas but got out of there um pretty quick and then um musically i guess my when i was growing up my dad was a pastor and i grew up in the church and uh, kind of found my way into into church music, um, playing guitar and stuff and kind of just, but, but very strictly in that world as far as music was. Like I just, mm -hmm. I would like, you know, sing with the adults some days or, or like hack away at the guitar, you know, because all church music is like C chords anyways. Um, so it worked <laughs> out and... Uh, and then maybe towards the end of high school and into college, I started writing my own songs, and and that felt 
pretty amazing. Um, and I never wanted to go back to anything resembling church music after that. Because when I started writing my own stuff, it was at the same time I started diving in deeply to, to um, exploring other people's music in ways that I hadn't before. I'd kind of grown up with my dad's music and my mom's music, which was great, but I didn't, you know, I didn't like research those artists. I didn't like dive deep into their stuff. And then I think in college I started doing that. Um, and then finding, you know, like if I love Bob Dylan and I love Neil Young and all these Jackson Brown and stuff, like who are the modern voices that, that evoke the same stuff? And then seeking out people like Josh Ritter and and Ryan Adams, unfortunately, what happened with Ryan Adams. But his music was amazing, is amazing. And, uh, yeah, so I don't yeah, know. Heartbreaker is one of the greatest albums that I've ever heard. I mean. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then in college, I went to school in, in Tacoma um, and just started playing out at little, like, open mic coffee shop things and things on campus and doing that. When did you first start playing some of your songs for your parents, and did they... What was their opinion on? You, I've never you, played my songs for my parents ever. Like not, ex it wasn't. I never like shared with them songs I'd written outside the context of a show. Like if they were at a show, mm -hmm. but I was. I'm always. I'm pretty private about what I'm making and when I'm making it. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I. I don't know when. I'm, that's a good question. When my parents first saw me play, it was probably at this place called Cosmic Pizza in Eugene. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know if that's still there anymore, but I used to go down there and they, they'd have like a one of those featured open mic nights where they'd have an open mic and then one artist would play like four songs and I'd do that occasionally. But And if you weren't singing a gospel tune, they were still cool with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, they were that's really good. supportive. And, um, re like like I've, I've heard, I've seen some old recordings and heard some old recordings of early days like playing at bars and stuff and it's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> But it, it makes me always really appreciate that I never sensed from my parents or my friends or anybody that they also shared in that embarrassment, which they probably did and should have <laughs> because some of it was so terrible. But they were just really encouraging. Yeah. And, when, and when you were writing your own songs and being inspired by the artists you mentioned, at what point were you like, I want to play this in front of people? Is that something you always wanted to do? I mean, you're you're so expressive in your songwriting. You do share a lot. You both do. <clears throat> but... um. You also are kind of reserved, and you come up. You are shy sometimes, yeah. you know. And to step on that boundary to share that with folks. At what point did you go? Oh, I want to do that. Actually, it, it was a weird moment. In maybe I was a junior in college, and there was a guy running for something <laughs> in Washington. Do you remember Dino Rossi? Yeah. What was he running for? I don't. I just remember really liking like his something? name. Yeah. Was it? I don't know. There's some guy running. For, he was like a Republican politician running for something in Washington. And a, a, a music producer that I knew, a sound engineer in Tacoma, was friends with this guy, Dino Rossi. And Dino, and I knew nothing about Dino's politics. I still don't. But he, he said, Dino's having like a campaign party, essentially, and he wants some live music. Do you want to play it? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And, and I showed up, and it was a bunch of like... Uh, very eager, like ultra conservative, really well dressed young people, and then me, like in like in my college like hobo days, and, and <laughs> I just your played first like show? yeah, that was my first. Wow, like, I did not know that. And it felt so. We're learning good. stuff. <laughs> it was in like a spaghetti pizza house in in Tacoma. Oh, and, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> And I wore all black, like a black button-down shirt and black pants, because I, I had just seen Josh Ritter wear all black, and um, and then I played these really. It was I played all original songs, and they were very like uh, angsty and political, um, and didn't fit with Dino Rossi's message at all, and, and the whole vibe in the whole room. <laughs> but I had a great time. It was really, but it just felt, yeah. That was my first like. I think there was a lot of freedom in it because it was completely anonymous. There was no friends of mine there. My parents were not there. It was just like a bunch of random politicians. And, yeah. That That's an interesting uh, observation. I mean, like, yeah, when you are playing in front of all your friends, on one hand, it could be super supportive and like, yeah, my team's here. On the other hand, it could be terrifying 
because yeah. these are the yeah. people you see on a daily basis. And yeah. so yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. Anna, can we dive into your world? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I grew up in a Northern Washington in a small town up there. And um, I played my, oh, my grandpa lived with my family for a while and he, he played violin and I really, really loved it and asked to play for a long time and started that when I was little and, I, yeah, my my folks are really musical, and they they love kind of the old time scene and the and the folk scene. My mom especially was like really. She grew up in Philly and and was like sixteen when all that stuff was happening wow. and did the protests and the Woodstock and the coffee houses and stuff like that and and played a little guitar and sang. And so I definitely grew up with their record collection and their reverence for for songs and for for like meaning in songs like my mom holds Joan Baez and Phil Oaks and all these people way way up high as as people that that were agents for change I think and that I definitely felt that growing up and but I didn't write I just I just always really loved to read and write like little stories and poems and stuff I never I was so shy and I still am pretty damn shy and but I never was like I want to write some songs and stand on a stage and sing them in front of people and, <laughs> but I just played fiddle and I moved to Portland to go to school when I was 18 and and I started kind of playing fiddle around with different bands and um and would just like was too scared to even say testing into a microphone uh, I don't know, uh, sometime after college, maybe when I was 24 or something, I borrowed my roommate's guitar and I wrote a thing and it just, I just felt like nothing I had ever experienced. So just a way to, to like work out your guts uh, and share it. I, yeah, I don't know. And it just was very immediately an obsession to me of, of a of a tunnel to dive into yeah i hope i never come out of it so so and that was all in uh in what in washington you said sorry oh uh, that was all well in portland so i i moved to okay. portland just okay. to go i was gonna go to nursing school and i did i really i jeffrey and i both actually me too attempted yeah. to be nurses and yeah, ended up as songwriters. <laughs> You're still caretakers if you think about it. Yeah, <laughs> just in a different different avenue. <laughs> we do that. We do reflexes on each other just to practice. Sometimes <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, I didn't make it that far. I made it about one semester <laughs> before I switched Me majors. Too. And, uh, but yeah, I forget what the question was. I'm sorry. No, Through just Portland, you started oh yeah, I, I just yeah in Portland after so I was just waiting tables for a while after college and not doing anything with my Spanish degree and playing playing fiddle and being like oh I really love playing music and and then yeah I just, I think it took song like writing songs for me to be like able to imagine doing that with like as a path in life just. I couldn't imagine anything else once I started doing that, even if in my head I didn't think this will definitely work, you know. I just thought, man, I don't know why, but I just got to do this all the time. But, yeah, who cool. knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think this is a, a good point to... Uh... If you guys don't mind, give us a song uh, each. That'd be really great. If you're just joining us, uh, this is Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin. They're in Portland, Oregon. And they're two independent singer-songwriters, and they also tour together a lot, and uh, they're good folks. So if you are just tuning in, please share this and comment below and let us know where you're watching from. But without further ado, uh, Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin. Maybe two strangers with you? Sure. Do you need this or are you good? Oh, I'm okay. I think. All right, here's a love song. First time that I saw you, you were waiting for the train. 
Your body like a shadow slipped away In a bright display of color And the tunnel swept me under And the last thing I remember was your face And I hoped you would appear in some old movie theater chair some old vinyl back booth diner way downtown And I watched for you in windows Sprayed your name across cement walls In parking lots when no one was around And the city lights They shine like silver And the city lights they shine like gold I'm holding out For something better What it is I don't know The second time I saw you, you were running in the rain Duck back into a Chinese restaurant And I drove around the block, cursed the lights, double parked Found only an old scarf that you forgot and I wore it that whole winter, hoped you'd see me in the street And your eye would catch, and suddenly you'd know A glance inside the subway, the central station bustling And two strangers locking eyes above it all And the city lights they shine like silver And the city lights They shine like gold I'm holding out For something better What it is I don't know And I'm alright if you're asking, I'm just tired, and I'm just stoned, and the city lights are a constellation, and your upturned face is what I'm looking for. And I came around the corner on a bitter Saturday A flower stand and trash cans on the curb I bought a cup of coffee from a man who never saw me Turned around and raised it up and there you were my heart escaped, my body flew right up and disappeared And I thought that I might lose you in the crowd But you crossed the street and suddenly your voice was in my ear Saying, don't I know your face from somewhere else And the city lights they shine like silver And the city lights They shine like gold I'm holding out For something better What it is I don't know I'm holding out For something better what it is, I don't know. That is beautiful. Thank Here's you. something you guys probably haven't heard in a while.
<laughs> oh my oh. gosh. Oh. Does that feel good? Does that feel it's like a drug. I'm going to sleep so good tonight. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Um, all right. <laughs> what was that song called again? That was uh, uh it's City called Two Strangers. Two Strangers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Sounds so good. Your setup there uh sounds beautiful, guys. Oh. All right, uh, Jeffrey, what are you gonna play for us? Uh you wanna sing that paper mache song? Yeah. Okay. That song. There's a song tentatively called Paper Mache Mountain. I think. <laughs> I had a dream I was singing a song on a heaven-bound ship But my eyes were closed so I didn't see any of it And I was shouting too loud to hear the answers freely given By an angel choir singing out to anyone listening I've been praying to get it right And working hard to get it wrong in the meantime And I've been trying to pick a fight But the man in the mirror won't look me in the eye There's a beautiful sound to the song of an empty surrender When the fire of your pride is burned all the way down to an ember And the mountain you made is just a paper mache of sad glory Built by a man who was trying too hard to write his own story oh, I've been praying Get it right And working hard To get it wrong In the meantime And I've been trying To pick a fight But the man in the mirror Won't look me in the eye Yeah, I've been trying To pick a fight but the man in the mirror won't look me in the eye. Wow. <laughs> I love how both your guys' songwriting just complements each other so well. And uh, mm, it's such you. a, yeah, it's so great. Thank you so much for both of those songs. And uh, for those of you guys just tuning in, uh, this is Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin. Uh, reporting from Portland, Oregon, uh, and I'm Casey Turner. I'm a, a concert promoter in San Francisco, and I've been very lucky to work with both these folks and put them on some of my intimate stages in the Bay Area uh, over the years. And uh, so oh, that's why we're all here. Yeah, man, you, yeah, the, what you've <laughs> done in San Francisco is like, there's nothing like it. It's really Dang. Oh, well, what you've thing. What you've done in Portland and all over the world, apparently, is <laughs> ditto, nothing like it. Um, yeah, we've had some really fun shows, and uh, what, uh, it's kind of it, it's a coincidence, but I've uh, but I've got to put both these guys in front of some legendary artists. Uh, I had a uh, Jeffrey open for Ramblin' Jack Elliott a few summers ago, and your I think your set was longer than Ramblin' Jack's. He played a pretty short one. <laughs> I remember. Well, yeah, or he um, played like three songs and talked for like an hour, which is just no. It was a thirty-eight minute set. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure, and I think your set was forty. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, no. a whole nother that's a whole nother story but uh <laughs> i do remember um jasmine who works with me and, and helps sell merch and stuff she goes i think we just broke our record on how many cds and openers sold i think you sold like 30 cds at that oh, show man. which first of all who buys cds I anymore no, i'm just joking no, um, kind of kind of yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's a that's a pretty good testament to the ears that you make happy and then also a few summers ago and i had you open for john doe of x oh, yeah. which is a, a fun pairing and that was so fun legendary you guys and then uh and then we've had some great shows with you guys together and then uh 
and and you, I think Jeffrey had had you play with uh, Galen Lee one of the last times yeah, you were through, which was really fun. I love that show. Yeah, it's so it's always show. it's always a pleasure to be able to put you guys in front of people because um, the response is always really great, and and your songs always come across. And oh, we appreciate it. Yeah, a, a joy, so yeah. um, so jumping kind of back into the story of all this, so. So we've talked about up to the point where you're playing uh, music and maybe even stepping out and, and sharing that at open mic nights and private events with politicians. Uh, <laughs> at what point, you know, do you recall having like kind of like what you would consider your first real gig where you're like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, are you opening for someone or you're joining someone or you're playing like a, a show at a venue and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm kind of really doing this for either of you guys can jump in on that. I don't know, I don't know if I've had that yet. <laughs> This is it. This is our first gig, Casey. Um, I think, well, I toured for a while with uh, the Shook Twins that are out of Portland playing fiddle with them, and it was kind of around the time when I was starting to write songs and, and making my first album. And and uh, they they were just like the most generous, wonderful, supportive people and, and just very creative and that was like a warm, warm bubble to get to tour with, but they would always let me sing a song or two, or they'd sing my songs from time to time. And it really, I feel like it was such a nice step into that world or that I was, I was such a, a stage frighter for a, a long time and, and to just get to step out for one song and have them play with me. And, and I, it was really, and to feel an actual audience that came to see music feel your song. It was a very much like, oh, that mm. I want to do more of this. So I really, I really always appreciate that they did that for me. Now, when you were uh, doing that, this was was this when you were Anna in the Underbelly? Yeah, yeah. I start, I uh, thought maybe I would have a band, and I so I called it Anna in the Underbelly, and then I had a band like one one hundredth of the time and proceeded to not be able to afford a band <laughs> at what point did you decide just to use your your name um i think i put i made my I second album oh i think it? you're right yeah i was making my second album and it was kind of like a i had made one album under anna and the underbelly and i had then proceeded to tour a whole bunch just myself and been like i'm anna and the underbelly but it was just me and <laughs> yeah, i remember like i was making my second album i was like i should probably just call to go by my name i think one of the first times i ever had you play something was that a little monday night series i was running yeah. called acoustic beast joe i think this was like 2011 like or restaurant. 12 yeah and I, it was definitely anna in the underbelly then mm -hmm. so yeah we date back man we date back yeah that's the yeah I was also, so excited you, for that. You were having such big problems. <laughs> like we used to talk about like how you, like, is it okay to introduce yourself as Anna in the Underbelly if there's no one if else it's on just stage? You. <laughs> and I remember we were like thinking of examples like, you know, like Bright Eyes and like yeah. all these people that give themselves stage names. I sort of wish, I, st I kind of wish that I had, maybe not that one in particular, but that I had started out with a name that's not my own, but I, I don't know. Also, I, just because it's nice to separate your your life from your, from your stage life, but I, <laughs> but I also feel like I don't, I, I've never been able to like wear a costume, a, or I'm just not a person that's very good at presenting something different from hmm. who I exactly am. So maybe it's good to just go by my darn name. <laughs> wear a nudie suit next time <laughs> next time around yeah. what about what about you jeffrey when did that 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 gap kind of get um i used to play this bar in eugene called lucky's and it was like really really terrible but great bar because it was like low pressure gig and um and, the, and one night there was a guy there's this brilliant promoter in eugene he runs a radio program and does um house shows his name is mike meyer and um he was there, and he, he needed an opener for uh, David Wilcox. Do you know that guy? I, I know of him. I don't He's know out him. out of North Carolina, but just a longtime folk guy. But he was coming through playing the Unitarian Church in Eugene. And, and I didn't know David Wilcox at all, really. And, um, and I, I just remember the feeling of showing up to that show and 
realizing that I was treating it too casually, like, because mm. I'd only played like bar gigs where no one listened ever. And, and Dave Wilcox showed up with like tons of gear and a sound person he traveled with and all this stuff. And he was, he was really wanting me to like get through my sound check so he could get back on stage and like dial in his sound again. And it felt intimidating in a good way to like, oh, this is like a, this is a real thing now, even though it was just like a, Unitarian Church, <laughs> but it was a it was a good lesson, like a good I don't know, yeah. yeah. That's cool, and that's that's neat. The it happened at Lucky's, so yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so at this point, when you're touring with the Shook Twins and you're um, starting to open up shows and and having that kind of awakening, were you guys doing music for a living at this point, or was it still kind of were you having something else kind of help fund that passion? I, I sort of was waiting tables part time and, mm -hmm. and was playing fiddle with with the twins. And then kind of, they they eventually were like, you should quit your serving job and you can do this. And then when I would tour with them and then when I wasn't touring with them, I would do my solo stuff. And it just sort of I moved into a little travel trailer for two years that was like real cheap mm -hmm. to live in and and that kind of made that possible to to just you know make very little and be gone all the time you've been you were i mean you've been doing music as your like pay the bills with music for a long time now like yeah. since like 2012 or 13 maybe yeah maybe, maybe you know, say like nine years or something I wow think. Yeah. yeah. Like, Congratulations. That's, that's, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't make that jump until 2016. Really. I was, I was like doing construction before, like, uh, in the, I don't know, for years. And then I went back to school and, and started teaching, teaching English for, and I did that for like four years, subbing and then full time through 2016. And, And then so now, and then so, um, when, at what point did you guys meet? When, when did your worlds collide? And um, we met. At, what year did we meet? You think two thousand? Me? Two thousand and eleven? No. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Cause yeah. I remember I was making a. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been actually because. Yeah. yeah. I yeah I I wasn't even living in Portland at the time, but we were, or I was playing at Mississippi Pizza. And, I lived right down the street from there, and yeah. a friend was like, you got to hear this guy. He's really amazing. He was. So you fell in love with the tunes first. That's a good. That's actually a good thing. It's, it's good because that would be the scariest thing, meeting someone, and then, like, you play their music for you. And they're like, not like oh. it. Oh, I, I know. We talk about uh, yeah, that all the time. I'm like, oh, what if I suddenly played, like, avant-garde, <laughs> yeah, doom metal? Would you still... <laughs> Yeah. And the answer is no. No. <laughs> yeah, when I mean when Anna and I met, I was I guess I wasn't dating anybody at the time, but I'd just broken up with this person I was in a long relationship with and Anna was dating somebody for a while after we met. Yeah. So we yeah, Spends really we just purely while. like kinda I was just blown away by her songwriting. I remember still like I was driving to some job in Eugene where I was building a deck and Anna had emailed me demos for your Brimstone Lullaby yeah, album, that, like yeah, for Anna and the, Anna and the under, Underbelly album, and I was just like, nobody writes songs like this. I yeah. uh, had the same reaction. I just was in that very first phase of like, what is songwriting? Why does it feel so amazing? And then hearing Jeffrey play just in this like noisy pizza place with his eyes closed and just like so deep in it and so lyrically astounding to me and yeah definitely I definitely what he was like a a hero before before we were even a friends hero. yes maybe I shouldn't say that out loud that, that, <laughs> I have to live with you <laughs> <laughs> you guys your next your next argument like hey who's the hero <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so since you guys have known each other and obviously living together and playing music together, has that changed your songwriting styles or do you approach, uh, do you think you guys make each other better songwriters because you guys are both inspired by each other, obviously, and fans of each other's yeah. music? Um, 
that I definitely think so. I think, like, you know, Anna, Anna will share a song with me she's working on. It'll make me want to write or make me want to write better <laughs> or try try harder or revisit stuff I'm working on, definitely. I don't know, like, I think I'm too close to our world to know how we influence each other, but I'm I'm sure we do. And I've, I've heard yeah. from people, too, that, like, they'll, like, find themes in certain songs that pop up in both of our both of our songs and stuff and whatever i mean maybe that's true or maybe there's a lot of dark themes in folk music that just <laughs> kind of re recycle over and over and over again but uh, yeah yeah i i definitely f feel like constantly like grounded by by you or like I there's like a there's like a authenticity to what you make that I feel like I feel it in my mind when I'm writing that I don't want to like Jeffrey's always the very first person I share things with and that is such a a gauge of whether a song is effective or you know if if I'm like telling the story I'm trying to tell or if it's a story I should be telling or if it's just a story I think might be cool to tell or something that I can I can like feel it when I play it for him and I, I think it's just because he's such a like he has such a reverence for simplicity and authenticity and not not like saying things that aren't yours to say that I yeah I, dr I really respect a lot I always do I always do like while she's playing these songs, I put my hand like this, and then whether it's going to be thumbs up or thumbs down by the and end, that's why I play knows. with my eyes shut. <laughs> no, I'm I just try to <laughs> fart so while he plays. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I don't know when you guys tend to do most of your writing uh, because you guys are usually gone most of the time. I assume you probably write on the road a lot. Um, I don't know for sure. And now that you're home, uh, does it make it harder to write when the person's right there, or is it? Um, are you guys finding your space to be able to make time to do it separately? And also uh, to add to that question, um, how much co-writing uh, do you, enters your world? <laughs> well, well, we've just finished. Uh, like, so we live in this in this sweet garage that's like turned into this loft apartment thing. Um, and then a, 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 right before this all hit, we finished this little like eight by 10 writer's shack in the backyard. It's just a really basic shack to go write songs in. And that's been amazing because it's like... That's like the best thing that happened to this quarantine in yeah. our lives. I, t like before the quarantine stuff, you know, we were both touring so much that we would have a lot of time alone at home, both of us. We'd like switch off kind of. And that's when a lot of writing would happen. Mm. And n neither of us are very good at r writing when someone else is in the room, you know, and not, not so much out of like, uh, I don't know, like, I don't feel like ashamed or anything yeah. so much as I just can't, I can't stay in my head, you know, when Anna's just farting and <laughs> walking around. And Sorry. So, so the shack has been pretty, pretty great. Um, yeah. I think we're both, we're both really internal writers and we don't, like we don't co-write at all. We never have, and I I would I'll be surprised if if we ever do. We probably will someday when we're like oh. yeah eighty yeah, we, seven and I just don't feel it in me. I, I, we have a lot of friends who who just like they get amped about co-writing and they and they seek out people to do it and they try and do it with either of us sometimes and stuff. <laughs> and I just I haven't had that in me yet where I'm like I really want to write with somebody and and when that comes I I hope I don't try and like squash it in any way but I just really enjoy being alone and writing in that space right now so I totally I understand that but I'm also very surprised that you've never co-written anything together uh I would assume that there'd be some point where you'd be stuck on something and you might bring it to Anna or vice versa and that's just that's surprising to me yeah. uh, that's great but I, I respect it but you like occasionally will just be doing like I don't know like maybe finishing touches on a song and it'll be like, should the word be this or should the word be that? Or and is this, or the, you know? yeah. And like very like small things, but yeah, 
But when you're sharing a song for each other, there's never that point of like, you know, I think you should word it this way. There's no critique. It's more or less. Mm, we do that of, for sure. We do that a little bit. Because, yeah. yes, definitely sometimes, you know, yeah. I'll put a word in the song that that doesn't, you know, it doesn't flow or, or it disrupts the flow of the song. And, and I will, you know. There's like grammatical things or, or things that help. I think we're like super tuned into what the other person is like what meaning they're kind of going for and and if there's a word that could be better jeffrey yeah. definitely helps i feel like quite a few times you've i'm like using a term that feels really good to me but it's like commonsensically doesn't make any sense or like you know i'm like Common and then you put <laughs> okay <laughs> see so like the ratchet like i put the ratchet on the cook stove or something he'd be like yeah you don't put the ratchet on the cook stove and yeah. That's that's yeah, a really you're, you're much more like you love like you love that's a great ex that's a perfect example of like you put the ratchet on the cook stove is something that syllabically you love oh. the, like those words even though there's it, no <laughs> there's no moment where you put a ratchet on a cook stove so yeah. that's helpful but you, could. you could you could yeah it. exactly yeah. my point. <laughs> Someone out there right now is putting a ratchet <laughs> on a cook stove and just laughing. Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, well, w one last little question, and I'd love to get some more songs out of you all, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, when you're writing your songs, because uh, I know Anna, this w last year you were touring with a band, and uh, Jeffrey, do you tour with a band? I I've only seen you solo, so I wasn't yeah. even sure. I haven't um, ever toured with a band. Um, I've, I've uh, like occasionally I'll have a buddy play guitar or something okay. on the gig, but that's about it. Yeah. Well, then maybe this doesn't quite apply then, but for Anna, um, when you're writing a song, do you think of a band in mind when you're um, putting it together? Um, like this last record, you know, it's got a lot of sounds on it and a lot of instrumentations. When you're writing the songs, did you hear those sounds in your head? Or I haven't, I haven't had that feeling until really recently i'm making that that record the question mm -hmm. w with that particular group of musicians in a room it really i ha i have like barely played with bands and even like when i came down with a band that was only a week-long tour and then the whole rest of the year was solo so i really i've toured like three weeks with a band in my whole life but but making that record i feel like i still like could hear all these sounds and now i've like I just recorded a new one that will be out in a while and I found myself writing a lot more with like the sounds that those musicians in particular can make and it was really exciting it was it really I just never had like the resources and the you know to to be able to invite other people in uh, on a regular basis and, and to be able to do that even just a little bit with really like expanded the the music in my mind behind a song, just really fun. It it makes sense for both of you guys, I think, to have some, like, a band sound because I feel like both of your songs, songwriting styles and the way you perform them, they have there's a lot of space, which yeah. is awesome because a lot of your lyrics, they leave the, they make you think, and you got to really process, like, what you just heard. And that space, for me, the listener, allows me to, like, really soak in, like, that line. Mm -hmm. And sometimes having like a string section and stuff just amplifies those emotions. Yeah, yeah. And um, I feel like, like for example, that last record definitely brought out some of that ambient. Um, I think yeah. I, I listened to an interview of yours. I'm so, I can't remember which one it was. And and the question was, do you feel like a band would step on your kind of delicate approach to? And and the answer was, I mean, when I saw that band live at the Lost Church in San Francisco the answer was no you it, it, you still stood out in front of it um even, even though it's like what was it, like four or five guys on stage it was yeah crazy. they were they're so fun to it's play a bit, with I, yeah. yeah it's a sensitive thing i think for for like very like story story based songwriting you like i i think that both of us really admire josh ritter for the way he's incorporated a band and and it's always been something that just like cinemafies 
his stories and it's never been something that like yeah. oh now these are rock songs yeah, and, Gregory, even yeah more. I was, totally. I was yeah. gonna say Gregory and Alan Eisenhoff yeah. is the same because he's his solo stuff is so whispery and yeah. and Bray LaMontagne mm -hmm. uh, but then when they add these really I mean you got to be a really good musician I think to back up artists like that and like you guys totally. because yeah. if you overshine the songwriting in this particular case you kind of kill the whole thing and and yeah yeah i love watching those guys play with anna because it's they're it's like they're they're listening so intensely and anna is a, like all like you're you know you don't have a super loud voice but your songs are very dynamic vocally still and so if someone's like not listening to all the dynamics that are you're leading with then then it just kind of turns into this kind of noise and they i think they just do such a good job and the guys you record with are amazing. yeah there it's yeah it's been really fun just to play with some people and just it feels so it really like communal i really love the just like not having any preconceived this is what the parts that i want i've never yeah. felt like that and just to come in and be like i love the way you play, play what you feel, and just having it go like that. I'm kind of interested, like because you have backed up so many folks um, on fiddle and and singing and mandolin and stuff too. But like when you're, I've seen you tour with, you know, like Peter Mulvey for example, and playing fiddle. Um, being a person that can be the front person in the uh, group, also being the side person experience you've had, does that kind of help you communicate to your bandmates? Like, hey because you know what it's like to be talked to from the person kind of running the show and you're backing them up or whatever that communication did that help you translate back to a, a band i think so sense? yeah and i i probably just i probably just approach them the way i feel as a backup player which is i love when people are just kind of leave it open and they give you some direction if they have some direction but it's not like you have to play the same thing every night it's more just like we're, we're making this feeling and I want you to give what you have to give to this feeling and that I just respond to that a lot more. So I think maybe I present that to a band, which is some people maybe don't want that kind of, they want a part, but yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I definitely learned a lot on that band tour as well because I, I am more used to either only being alone or being a backup person. And there were times when I was like, I needed to be the one who made the decision. And and I think my natural way is to be like, oh, what do you guys want to do? But it's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I need, I'm the, this is my tour. I need to make this, they don't need to make this decision kind of. But. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, can you guys give us a couple songs? Mm -hmm. What do we got? Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is Jeffrey Martin and Anna Tivill. Uh, you're watching. There's holes in all the sidewalks where the wind it brings the rain in And the gold crowns have been found out to be brass that has been painted and There's holes in all our Bibles where we make secret compartments To hide the broken treasures we smuggled out garden yeah. and we gaze at our reflections like insecure children poorly dressed and always panicking in the bodies of men and women and we stumble on like drunkards toward a cliff just because none of us cares about the end when we try and find love And we get moving in the morning We suffer on into the evening 
Where we finally drink the whiskey that soothes our disbelief. While others find a quiet place and build a fence around it. Spend their time on the money they make and find ways to talk about it. There's an angry man on the mountain, just like there's always been. And there's a quiet man in the valley standing taller than him. And there's a child with a secret that she doesn't know she holds. And the fact that I can see it means that I'm growing old. Some of us get lucky, find an anchor in the storm. And some of us never learn to see beyond the place we were born. But time is a mystic with a briefcase in his hand. You can pay to look inside it, but you can't afford to understand. Maybe heaven is a place that doesn't have an address. And maybe that's okay, just like joy or sadness. You can meet God in a cigarette, just the same as in a sermon. And the devil's always listening to those who are deserving. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Gracie. Oh. oh, yeah, before you put your headphones back on, I was clapping, so you know. <laughs> I, heard it. I heard it even on the ground. Can you send me a question real quick? Yeah. Okay. In my dream you were beautiful, backlit, noble, in the low light of the window you were leaning on the edge. The high rises and billboards for perfume and call girls, the steam above the dark road, the smoke around your head. And I knew you by description, the tall tales, the pictures, your short hair and your lipstick, the smell of coming rain. And I wanted to remain there, a voyeur, a stranger, below you in the night air, just waiting to be changed. An eyeliner and nylons, the calm upon your face drawn, revealing next to nothing, a deal you don't believe. And the Bible in a locked drawer, the past you gave it up for, the hymnal and the comfort in exchange for living free. And lined up with the laundry, your slacks and all your stockings, suit jacket and the soft things, you dance in when you dream. And the neighbors never mention, the woman they see leaving is the man who 
works the morning shift selling gasoline. In my dream, you were stone still, shadowed, half built, a masterpiece of pure will, just waiting on the wall to gaze upon your body, a razor on a rough cheek, a blaze of burning beauty, the saved and the worth saving. A curtain, a play with no good ending, a prayer that never mentioned the glory of the question, and the answer is the same. Oh, man, it's so good. That's Anna Tivill, uh on that song, The Question, and uh, Jeffrey Martin. Uh, these guys are in Portland, Oregon, and uh, you can, if you look in the comments below, you can find uh, links to their websites where you can buy their records, which I highly recommend doing. It's a good time to buy a record and uh, put it on. You've got time to listen to it, and they've got time to ship it, so uh, it's a win-win scenario. Um, if you are just joining us, thank you for being here. I'm Casey Turner. This is my little podcast conversation thing called Talk to Me, which has been my kind of way of staying sane during this time. I I feel very lucky I can call friends up like these guys and we can talk and put it on the internet and yeah. feel like we accomplished something today. Yeah. <laughs> and it does yeah, feel that way. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for giving us that feeling today. <laughs> yeah, it does. it's just so nice to, I've been saying this, to put something on the calendar uh, that you know is not going to get canceled. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you guys so much for being part of it. And thank you to everyone out there that's been watching. And thank you all for sharing this. Uh, if you missed anything in the beginning, it'll be up to watch afterwards. And it'll also be put up on YouTube so you can share with folks who are not on uh, Facebook. But um, cool. I want to talk about just a couple more things. We've got some fan questions. And then we'll play a couple more songs and call it a day. Is that cool awesome. with you guys? Yeah, that's great. Great. Well, one thing I wanted to touch on, um, you know, uh, folks that uh, well, I know and you know for sure the independent artist touring world is hard and we're all out there doing it and and trying to hook our songs into ears and and you know for some folks there's little bleeps of awesome success and some years it's just you know working your butt off and I will say like the last couple of years uh, Anna especially with this record um, the question there was a moment I couldn't every time I open up my phone it's just Anna Tivel this Anna Tivel that I mean like the the press and response you got from this album was pretty overwhelming. Like that must have felt so great. Yeah, it felt it felt really good, and it that stuff. So I, Jeffrey and I talk about this a lot. It's so like we've both just been like chipping away at this thing, kind of really DIY, and and just touring our butts off and writing our butts off, and just and there's so much hard work that goes into it, but also to like to have your audience grow there's also so much luck that you don't always have control of and just the luck of somebody opening the cd at the radio station or what you know all these things that that don't have to do with the actual thing you're making and and yeah so i, I feel like i you know worked my butt off and, and wrote songs i really believe in but also i had like that was a very lucky moment where i feel like that that stuff kind of snowballs a little bit where mm -hmm. if one person gives it some love then you know other people start to notice a lot more and that yeah that felt like a very yeah that was Good. really yeah really lucky time for sure yeah i mean i don't want to make your cheeks turn super red but just for so the audience knows um <laughs> some of those uh mentionable um uh, things i'm talking about like npr called uh, this uh, called this record the question by Anna Tivel one of the most ambitious folk records of 2019 
Uh, Pace Magazine said it's one of the top 10 essential folk albums of the year, 2019. And then Rolling Stone, that little article magazine that's been out for a couple of years, Rolling Stone Magazine said she was the standout performer of the 2019 Americana Fest. Hearing all that and, and, and knowing how hard you work, and I know you're very humble and, and very, um, you know, you're an exciting person, but you really do, you're pretty contained. You, um, how does it? How does it? How does? It, how did it feel reading these reviews? I mean, I I feel like reading them. You deserve it absolutely. Um, but I know how how did it, it it feel taking that in? It just felt really. It just feels good to like your your always your hope is to get to do. Like I just want to write songs and I want to play them for people and be able to survive doing that and everything that that helps and and that was like a particular moment that people were really paying attention and saying really kind things about about the thing that you've just been like working so hard at and and that always it always just feels very very rewarding and 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 like a p pat on the back after you know a lot of nights playing to drunk nobody and just being like i i like this i don't i guess it doesn't matter if anybody likes it and so it always feels good to have somebody be like yeah keep doing what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> well um that I, I hope you guys do go out and buy that record it is really um exceptional and uh yes, and i i mean that's 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 the thing about this whole COVID thing that one of the things aside from you know the terrible things happening in the world but um on more of a lighter note with people's careers just saying like you know a lot of people don't realize how long it takes to get that momentum rolling and uh i was talking to john craigie about this too you know and uh being at that kind of like peak of your independent career is like, ah, and then like all of a sudden for everything to be on pause it makes it even harder i'm sure and uh but i have faith that when we all get back on the road and it'll it'll just take take off even more before oh, yeah. we left off you know i think both of us have been pretty overwhelmed in a good way by like like i didn't re i didn't realize i guess in you know that i've been but i just didn't realize that there were uh, uh, um, I, I think touring especially when you're doing it the way we've done it where you kind of like diy your way through it and it's all pretty much on you to book the shows and book the tours and drive the tour and whatever and mm -hmm. sometimes it can feel uh like you're just throwing money and time and your voice <laughs> into this big, big void and, and very little comes back to you sometimes. And now, I don't know, it's been amazing because like just to get letters in the mail from people every week and have people tuning into these live shows and stuff that are just people all over the country and all over the world that are fans and it feels really a, 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 like a much needed boost to me and I'm so excited to get back on tour. Um, but it's so good to see this kind of like grassroots yeah. thing is amounted to this little like, you know, it might be just like a weed in someone's driveway, but it's still something there right now <laughs> that feels good. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I got a couple of fan questions here for y'all. Is that cool? Let's see what yeah. we got here. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, Donald Cohen asks, how do you think songwriting and music can lift the uh, values and ideas of justice, community, and the environment. Well, they Heavy. certainly can't. I mean, <laughs> they certainly can't do that. That's a big, big question. I th well, I think my first thought on that is that I think that um, authenticity can benefit all those, that whole agenda, that whole list he gave. Um, authenticity in art, and in, in the, in the, on the flip side, when, when people write, songs or when they create art that speaks to a movement or something and it, it's not authentic it has the opposite effect at least for me when i hear a song that's like it just feels hokey or forced and it's political that's like the one-two punch and i just turn it off like i don't want to you know but if i hear a song that's written from a, a, a really genuine place and happens to be political or perceived that way then that's like brilliant you know, and does a lot to elevate things. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I just believe really, really deeply in, in the, in the power in art to like reflect small stories as a way of, of kind of sh feeling empathetic 
towards situations, but also like bringing people into a situation and like we need, like that stories have just always been what people used ever since we spoke. And even before that, I think to, to share feelings with each other. But I know when I read like an article full of statistics about homelessness or something, I, it washes over me in a much different way than if, than if I read a personal account of somebody who's homeless and what they're going through. And, and the same, I think, goes for, for songwriting, especially in art and to, to, to like tell really personal s stories as, as a way to, to dive into those situations, not, not in a like, we need to stand up and cure homelessness, but, but as like a, oh, look how this affects people kind of way it f feels. Yeah, I don't know. I, I believe in that. I think that's a good answer. Um, Heather Steika asks, uh, ah, hey, Heather. Heather. <laughs> she says, uh, how do you guys write your persona songs? Is there a character who comes to mind first or a line, a verse, a chorus that shapes itself into a character? Yeah, these are really good questions. <laughs> I feel like you, Heather writes some kick-ass songs of her own. Yeah. <laughs> you impressed me by your ability to write about real people. Like, mm. like just in your geographical proximity. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, a big you, writer like, about the neighbors. <laughs> just like things you see, I just did it in it. Like, I feel like if I try and write about our neighbor, then it, it, it loses a lot of its, like, uh, poetic mm. I don't know, feel but you can do it you can write about concrete like that guy fred and then turn it into this really poetic thing that's interesting that you say that though because you totally do that like that sad people. blue eyes and... i was just gonna i was actually yeah. just gonna say it because that particular song sad blue eyes has so many concrete variables yeah. in it um it's friday night you know but yeah but in terms of like you know it i can't trace anything in that song back to any exact. individuals i've ever met you know what i mean like and I feel like you do a really good job mm. of, you just change their name, but it's yeah, you know, our neighbor or something. <laughs> neighbor next door. I don't know how, that's a great question. That's yeah. a mystery to me because uh, for me, it is it is a line. It's usually an, a, 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 an image, like a, an action or like a, you know, some unnamed person who doesn't even like have a gender or whatever is just doing something in my mind or they're responding to a situation or I'm writing and it just is like one sentence that stands out and it becomes this like thing that kind of builds mass around it and that that eventually that character gets kind of fleshed out in the song but I definitely don't try and invent whole fully formed <laughs> people in my mind and then write about it or something yeah yeah I don't either that I I don't think I don't set out with with a person and all their personality traits ever yeah. in my head, but it's, but there is a lot of like f f this is weird, but, but like freedom in the structure of of speaking through a character in a song because they there's so much uh, like everybody knows people and they know people that have gone through those things or the end so it's so much easier to relate sometimes to a character than to tell the story without a person in it uh, I, and even just in writing sometimes I'm trying to relay a feeling and I'm doing it without a character and it's not working and it's not working and sometimes I'll bring in a character and suddenly it feels really real in a way that it didn't before yeah. I don't know I wrote down like I wrote down a line the other night just randomly that um, uh, what, what was it? Oh, is Linda, Linda plays Ke Kino? <laughs> yes. And like that to me is, is like, I love lines like that. Cause I, That's in my head, movie. at least I can see exactly what Linda looks like because she's playing Kino and I know <laughs> what time of day it is. And I know it's in scuzzy, like stale smoke, terrible bar slash deli where there's Kino and like that stuff I like a lot for some. Yeah. Yeah, it's like part of a part of a painting that gets made kind of is these these people yeah. that we've all come across. We are also in ourselves. And, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, be careful what you say to Anna and Jeffrey. You might, uh, Linda. Very true. Uh, the so next uh, question. The next question comes from Linda. Um, how did you know? Uh, we got time for a couple more, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll cruise on out of here. Uh, this question is actually for Anna. Uh, Kevin uh, Shavery of San Francisco writes: uh, What is the story behind your song Illinois? Um, I wrote that song, somebody that I, that I love a whole lot, uh, was in a really super abusive relationship and, and, uh, and kind of had gone into it with all this hope of it being this new, new kind of, uh, thing to, to fill them up and, and it just wasn't that and it never was. And I was just thinking about all the, all the ways that, that people, put their hope in a love that's not that's not a good situation and it, I think it came came out of came out of that Brandon Schmeltz asks what makes Portland such a fantastic place for songwriting because we have fluoride in our water <laughs> don't we yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I mean it's not a very in terms of like big cities, Portland's not a very big city. It's, it's definitely not a big city. But, uh, because of that, I think um, there's there's like an air of competition in L.A. and in Seattle and in Nashville. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your sound's cutting out a little bit on that microphone. Yeah, I lost that microphone. Hmm. That's weird. That's sorry. weird. I think you're coming through Anna's. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. Speak away. Sorry, can just, you repeat I think that? Like a, yeah, there you are. Yeah. There's like a a competition maybe that exists in other bigger cities that doesn't exist here yet because there's not there's not a big foothold from like music industry people here. Not big ones. There's not like like long established stuff like in LA and San Francisco or in Nashville and stuff. And so it just feels kind of like at least my experience of it has been people are very willing to share music and, and collaborate and bring songs to each other. And it, um, there's just, there's just, if someone does well, that's in my circle, I feel like they, they want to elevate everyone else in their circle in a, in a really genuine way. And I feel like it kind of contributes to this culture of like openness and creating things and, uh, challenging each other in the best ways to like write better and better and better songs. And, um, yeah. Um, our last uh, thing here is is more of a statement uh, from our friend uh, Stephen Foxbury. Uh, ah. He says, uh, uh, "Promote your your weekly live stream. Promote it." So you want to talk talk about your weekly live stream that you're doing here? Oh yes, we. Uh, th Steve is both of our manager. <laughs> in case <laughs> we, we we love him so dearly. Uh, yeah, we've been doing a show from our writing shack every Sunday night and it's been really 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 fun we've it's yeah we're gonna keep we're gonna keep doing it I think. forever every Sunday at five o'clock yeah on every Sunday at five o'clock Pacific uh, mm -hmm. daylight time Pacific time yeah and it's on my music Facebook page but we will okay. post it every week and okay. yeah yeah be sure to find Anna Tivel then on Facebook and uh, tune in on Sundays at five o'clock California Pacific daylight time and uh, yeah for, yeah, for some reason, Jeffrey, that microphone's not working anymore. Not working so. anymore. So when you play your song, be sure to lean in on the other one. But um, you've been listening to Jeffrey Martin and Anna Tivill. Thank you guys so much for being here. They're going to leave us with a couple songs. Uh, take it away. <laughs> yeah. No, go for it. Okay. Um, do I got one? Let's see. I'll, I'll play this song. This is a – I wrote this during the quarantine. Um thinking about all of us in our separate places going through this crazy thing together by ourselves. It's called All Together Alone. Silence descending, the last note in neon Still melting the ice in the glass 
Turn the key over and pocket three dollars in quarters. They might be your last. But don't be afraid as you're walking away in a quiet like you've never known. Everything's changing, and all of these strangers are all together alone. All together alone. And call up your brother and tell him you wanted to be there the last time he flew. To visit the family, but you were still angry, and man, you'd go back if you could. And don't be afraid; you've got so much to say, and he'll stay like a friend on the phone. Everything's changing, and all that remains is we're all together. And lay on the carpet, alive in the darkness, an animal starting to dream. This won't be easy. A catch in the heartbeat of everyone trying to breathe. But don't be afraid. There's a feeling of safety in knowing your struggle is known. Everything's changing, and all of these strangers are all together. Man, it's so good. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I can move. Mm, that is a good song. Anna's been writing real songs since, real since songs. we've been home. <laughs> <laughs> I love that your dog has just been totally passed out this entire time. He's on, <laughs> he's on Benadryl, so he's he's all sleepy because he's got allergies or something. It's great. <laughs> He is alive though, right? There's the, yeah, okay. he's alive. He's <laughs> <laughs> always like this, even off a men drill. <laughs> well, uh, what should we play? How about um, how about not a sad, super sad one? What? I've got that far away sadness. Find my eyes again And I know you can see it You can always look right in And I try to hold a smile As we roll on for miles Playing songs for strangers In towns that aren't ours let that old time music burn a hole in my chest Burn a hole in my chest And see you laying in the grass In that thrift store dress In that thrift store dress I never know I'm leaving all the places I want to stay till I realize the feeling that our love has gone away 
And it makes me want to have children and build a house that can't be moved. Still, I'm thankful in my wandering that I'm wandering with you. And let that old time music burn a hole in my chest. Burn a hole in my chest. And see you laying in in that thrift store dress in that thrift store dress and say design as pure as any that a woman makes this man better than he is when he's trying understand the world from an island he built of lonesome dreams at night you sing the parts of me that I haven't ever seen and let that old time music burn a hole in my chest burn a hole in my chest See you laying in the grass in that thrift store dress, in that thrift store dress. See you laying in the grass in that thrift store dress, in that thrift store dress. Man, this has been such a wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you guys so much for being part of this. This is Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so much for having us. Oh, man, it's been so much fun. And, and we, I hope that people who know you guys learned a little something new. And I hope that we <laughs> turned on some new fans to your music. And I cannot wait till you guys do get back on the road and come see us in San Francisco again. And uh, and all your friends and family and uh, fans out there all over the world. I hope you go and get to finish up your European tour. <laughs> yeah, soon. we will. Yeah, we, we will. do too. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, everyone, for uh, checking this out. Uh, be sure to go down below to the comments and find the links with their website so you can buy their records. And there's some options there too if you want to throw a couple bucks to support this endeavor that I'm on. Um, our next episode is Thursday, uh, June 4th, with our good friend Matt the Electrician from Austin, Aww. Texas. Hey, so that's that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, support live music wherever you are, if you can, online for now. And, uh, and But but without uh, anything else to say, I really do appreciate your guys' music, and I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to, to be part of this. Likewise, Casey. Oh, yeah, Thanks thank for doing you. this. Man. It's great. Thank you. Uh, I wish everyone out there... Uh, to have a good day and to be uh, safe and stay healthy, take care of one another, and uh, we'll see each, everyone. We'll be, be able to see each other soon, hopefully in person. Uh, so can't wait for that that day to come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, you guys take care. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye everybody.